It's great chill, Hela. My name is Peter Underwood. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm from Wasanich, tuning in from the South Island of uh, Vancouver Island in Wasanich and Lekwungen territories. Hi, everyone. My name is Maureen Go, and I am casting to you live today from the unceded territory of the Kokwapua First Nations here in the very northern tip of Vancouver Island. Um, we're very excited for everyone to join today. So yeah, with every episode, we love to hear where everyone is coming from. So share with us in the chat um, where you're coming from, maybe the different names that you know for your location. If this is your first episode or if it's your fifth or more episode, we'd love to hear all that. So uh, share with us. And as you're doing that, I'm going to introduce um, our live studio attendees. So we have with each week classrooms that are joining us in our live broadcast studio. So today we have two classes joining us. So I'm going to uh, showcase our first classroom guest. Uh, and I just like them to introduce themselves, the name of their school, where they're casting from, grade, and hopefully we can see a nice pan of where they're joining from. All right, so we have Tai Elementary. Hi, Tai Elementary. Can you guys hear us? I think you guys are on mute. <laughs> I can see some hands waving around. Oh. Hello. Um, sorry, my hair is a mess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, we are Tai Elementary, located on the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Coast Salish peoples. We are a grade of four, five, six class, the Montessori School, and we are so excited to be here with you today. Awesome. Can we see a pan of everybody in the classroom? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Hi, everyone. Ooh, I like the light. We're very excited. A lot of you guys. Great. <laughs> so excited. Okay, thanks for joining. Yeah, we'll visit you guys again throughout this the episode. And then we have Mr. Honer's science class, and we have you guys here. Um, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, hey. Nice to um, my name is Mr. Honer, and uh, this is Grade Nine Science from Parkland Secondary over in Sydney, BC, on the traditional territories of the Sanic First Peoples. So we're very happy to be here again. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Honer's class is a returning class, uh, so they're seasoned pros now as well. But very happy to see you guys again. So welcome. Thanks. Um, yeah, Peter, who do we have joining? Looks like online we have a hello from Souk and Scotland. Someone from Penticton, um, just Canada, all across Canada, uh, Great Britain, um, the Pacific School of Innovation, and uh, Science in Saanich. Good to see you all. Yeah, it's always nice to, to see how far reaching uh, some of our visitors are and uh, viewing from. So that's great to see people from all over. Um, so. Welcome again to Coastal Insights, Eyes on the Coast. This is our season two of a series. And if you're new to this series, this whole series is focused on really connecting people to our coastal British Columbia environment and its conservation issues. Um, and so we're doing that in this season through what we call a two-eyed seeing principle. And so working with Brain Coast, we do a lot of scientific investigation that represents kind of academic Western science and so that's the lens that we bring to a lot of the topics that we're covering in this series. And Peter? Yes, and I, uh, yeah, I get to, uh, to learn everything that's, that uh, all these scientists that we have these guests have to offer. And I get to kind of connect that with everything I've learned throughout my life about kind of uh, coastal and Sanish, Coast Salish teachings and understandings of, you know, conservation, restoration, uh, anything on the coast and, and anything in this kind of realm. Um, yeah, it's really nice to connect it with some of the creation stories I've heard and, and have like a, a full understanding that kind of connects uh, like Western sciences and indigenous histories and sciences. Yeah, so this whole series, this two-eyed scene principle is really drawing from the strengths of using indigenous and Western scientific uh, perspectives to really open up your world to understanding the natural world and looking at ways at how we can approach conservation and stewardship um, with so many more tools and ways of looking at things. So today's episode, we're really excited because we have a whole uh, special panel of guests visiting us today. And usually we have 
um, guests only on our Spotlight Edition, but today's lesson, we have um, a panel of Rain Coast scientists visiting us today to share more about some of the work they're doing. So today's episode is focused entirely on conservation in action. So all of our past episodes in season, season one and season two, we've basically touched upon different ideas about learning on the coast here, some of the wildlife, the ecosystems, um, and also touching upon the threats. But today, we really wanna pinpoint some of these issues on the coast and really look at what is being done and what potentially we can do to help um, in the future. Okay. So just to recap on last, um, one of our previous episodes, we talked a lot about wild salmon. And it's a kind of a small poster here, but we basically visualize the whole path and journey that salmon take from egg to adults back to their stream to spawn again. Um, so I'm just gonna, yeah, so we kind of looked really deeply into that journey and also all the different things that the wild salmon encounter along the way. So this is just the bottom half of that poster. And today for our first guest, we're gonna speak a lot about this estuary area. So the estuary, oh, if you wanna go back, sorry, Peter, just one um, last thing on this. The estuary is the area where the fresh water from the stream, the river meets the salt water area. And so these areas are really critical for salmon because it's this huge transition area where they really have to adapt into this totally different environment. And so it's very critical habitat as well. But if you see in this kind of picture, that area where the two waters meet, there's a lot of things happening as well. Um, so our first guest is, is going to be sharing more about the Lower Fraser River. Um, and so we have Dave Scott, a research and restoration coordinator for the Lower Fraser Salmon Program, um, to tell us more about this incredibly important uh, part of our ecosystem and what is being done to help protect some of these wild salmon. So welcome, Dave Scott. I'll let you take it from here. Right. Thanks, Maureen, for the introduction. Um, yeah, happy to uh, be here and, and share some information about uh, yeah what I've been working on for the last few years. And so I'll just start with, um, I'm here today in uh, the city of Vancouver uh, on the unceded territory of the Squamish, tsleil uh and Musqueam uh, First Nations, as well as uh, the uh, traditional territory of the Tawasan First Nation. And I'm gonna be, uh, yeah, giving you a bit of information about a big restoration project that uh, I've been leading in the estuary for the past few years. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Cool. So that looked good, Maureen. I'm gonna assume that it's good. <laughs> so I'm gonna be talking to you today about uh, a big project that I've been working on um, as, a, as a biologist with Rain Coast, um, but I'm also a PhD student uh, at the University of British Columbia uh, with the Pacific Salmon Ecology and Conservation Lab. And so we've been working on uh, yeah this big project in the Fraser Estuary. And just to, to give you a little bit more information first, uh, so here's a here's a satellite image of the the Fraser River Estuary or the uh, the lower mainland of British Columbia. Uh, we have the city of Vancouver, the city of Richmond, and yeah, you can generally see uh, just a, a lot of development. Um, but you should also notice this uh, very large river that uh, runs through. Um, right through the lower mainland and that's the uh, the Fraser River, uh, the lower Fraser and the Fraser Estuary. So you can see uh, where all of that fresh water is kind of meeting the ocean um, and it's, it's creating this huge plume of, of fine sediment and fresh water um, that's, that's very distinct because it's a, a very large river. So the Fraser River uh, is about a quarter of British Columbia. Um, and so you have this huge amount of water that comes down the river each year. <coughs> Excuse me. But <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, there's several barriers in the Fraser River estuary that uh, really disconnect the estuary. And uh, this is a common problem that we have across British Columbia. And so in response to that, in uh, 2016, uh, they launched something called the Coastal Restoration Fund, uh, Fisheries and Oceans did. Um, and we were uh, lucky enough to, uh, to get some funding from uh, 
from Fisheries and Oceans to do a, a coastal restoration project here in the Fraser Estuary. And unfortunately, the reason for, for you know, needing to do this, this work is that uh, the status of our, our salmon in the Fraser River is not very good, especially our Chinook salmon, uh, which we know uh, particularly rely on these estuary areas. So, um, you know, we have newspaper headlines like half of Canada's Chinook salmon are endangered. And so that's, you know, the real motivation to go out and, and try to do some restoration. And um, and yeah, Chinook uh, really like to use estuary habitats for, for a while before they make their way out to the ocean. Uh, so that's why we, we started to target the estuary. And so this is another way of looking at the Fraser River estuary, and this is looking at it by habitat. And so you can see that that the cities have removed, uh, you know, a, a significant chunk of, of the habitat that once existed in the estuary. Uh, but we also have these different barriers. And so uh, when you looked at that, uh, the previous satellite image that showed that that plume of sediment there, what happens each year is in a natural river system is that uh, the river brings sediment down with it as it as the water flows. But then when the river meets the ocean, like in the estuary here, that actually slows down the flow of the of the river. And the slower the river is moving, the less and less sediment that it's going to continue to move. So basically, the river brings a whole bunch of sediment down and it drops it off in, in the estuary here. And so these big sand and mud flat areas that you see, those have been created slowly over time by this uh, deposition of, of sand and, and silt from upstream. But in the Fraser River, we have one of the busiest shipping lanes in North America, and we have this huge amount of, of shipping activity that they want to do, uh, both in the, the north arm and in the main arm of the river. And so in order to facilitate that, uh, what happened over 100 years ago is uh, they built these structures. So all of these red lines that I've added here are these um, are these different jetties that they've built in the estuary. And that's really to maintain that channel that you can see running through there. And if it weren't for that, it would actually be really shallow at the mouth of the river and it wouldn't be any good for, for shipping. So uh, we have these barriers now all across the estuary. And unfortunately, what they're doing is they're really preventing fish from moving from the river into the habitat parts of the estuary. And they're really pushing them just out into the ocean. And so that's not really great if you're a little juvenile fish and you haven't had enough time to grow and you haven't had enough time to get ready to deal with the salt water either. So uh, we wanted to start start looking at that. And so this is the, the main arm of the Fraser River right where it meets the ocean. And you can see that we have, uh, if you look at the image in the top left, you can see uh, we have habitat on one side, uh, river on the other. And unfortunately we have this eight kilometer rock wall separating the two. And so uh, this is a photo from uh, back in uh, 2018. Uh, but since then, we have created three breaches in this jetty to allow the movement of juvenile salmon. So what that looks like is a pretty serious uh, construction project. So we have uh, these big barges and cranes and uh, this big scoop out there. And we started in, in 2019 and we went and we dug out three breaches and we just dug them down by about a meter and a half. And since then, we've been going back and digging them down by another meter and a half so that they're basically at the level of low, low tide so that they're connected all the time. And we can start allowing juvenile salmon to actually move into those marsh habitats instead of getting pushed out to sea. And so now if you look at it uh, from above, you can see we have these three openings uh, that juvenile salmon can use to move uh, from the river and into the into the marsh. And so. It's great that you know we've gone out and created this, uh, but what we really want to do is do monitoring and see, you know, now that we've built it, uh, have they come? Are the juvenile salmon actually using this area? And so, uh, as part of my uh, PhD, uh, I've been doing uh, monitoring at these breaches ever since they've been created, and so. Uh, in 2019, uh, you can see that uh, the breaches just had these small channels behind them. Uh, the top images are our east breach and, and our west breach on the right hand side. And so soon after construction, there wasn't a whole lot of, of water that was making it from the river uh, into the marsh, just these small channels. But you can see that uh, by last year, 
the the flow of the river uh, has created these really nice natural channels uh, that are really starting to allow a lot of fish movement. And so we've been out there um, and you can see here, uh, so this is what we do is we go out uh, with nets and we are on the side of the marsh right behind our breaches. And we string these nets across the channel and we simply just capture fish that are, are moving from the river uh, into the channel. And you can see that essentially our net is blocking off the whole area and we get a nice movement of water. We get a lot of water moving through our net there um, and we're able to yeah get an idea of whether or not fish are using it. And so um, we went out, uh, pretty soon after construction uh, in 2019 and we caught 554 salmon over the season. So uh, we sampled about 13 times uh, and you know each time, especially early in the spring, uh, we captured uh, some juvenile salmon moving through our breaches, uh, mostly uh, Chinook, which is our you know main target, and then chum, which are also known to uh, rely on estuary habitats as well. So uh, we were pretty happy with that in, in 2019, uh, but we went out again last year in 2020 when the breaches were getting bigger and we almost tripled our numbers. So we captured almost 1500 juvenile salmon this time. And we actually captured uh, all five species of salmon as well. So not just Chinook and Chum, uh, but last year we caught uh, pink salmon, coho, and even a whole bunch of sockeye. So really, really exciting to see all of these different salmon moving through these breaches that we have just, just recently created. And I just wanted to really highlight our, our Chinook data. And so this is showing you uh, the fork length. So how long a fish was um, for a given date that it was captured moving through our breaches. And if you look at uh, the two pictures on the bottom, um, these are two different types of Chinook that we have in the Fraser. So we have these smaller Chinook uh, that are known as ocean type fish, which move through the estuary uh, pretty slowly they stay there and they grow and feed over time and uh, and then eventually move on to the ocean uh, and then on the other hand we have these fish that are called stream type chinook so they actually spent a whole year in fresh water already uh, getting big and strong and those fish we generally see just moving through very quickly and so uh, we were really really excited in, in 2020 that we started catching these bigger, longer fish uh, in May that were moving through our breaches as well. So not only are we seeing the, the, the little guys, but we're seeing the big Chinook too. And we're seeing them moving through our breaches all through the year uh, as it, but dropping off. So you can see from March all the way through August, we had fish using these breaches. And so we're only out there sampling a, a tiny fraction of the time that, that the breaches are connected. So if you were able to, you know, actually multiply the, the catches that we've had versus the amount of time that uh, the water is flowing through the breach, you know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of salmon using our breaches. So we're, uh, we're super, super excited about that. And so just uh, to wrap up in 2019, we were out there right after the breaches were created. Uh, there weren't really great channels, but we started catching uh, all these different types of juvenile salmon. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the image on the bottom uh, right there, the, in that viewer, there's a sockeye, a pink, a chum, and a Chinook salmon. The, the one on the bottom right is a sockeye. The one kind of right in the middle is a pink. Um, the one on the very far left is a chum and the one just inside of that one is a Chinook. And so uh, in 2020, we had days where we were catching all the species of salmon at the same time moving through the breaches together. So really, really exciting. Um, and we're seeing those those Chinook using the breaches from March all the way through August. So, uh, you know, that's our target is to, is to help Chinook get into the estuary. And we really seem to be successful at doing that. And so, um, now we're, we're continuing to do monitoring. Uh, I've already been out at the breaches uh, this spring. I'm gonna be out at the breaches tomorrow, uh, hopefully catching some more salmon uh, if the wind will cooperate. So uh, we're, uh, we're continuing to, to do the phase two construction to bring the, the depths down. 
And we're seeing this really awesome channel development occurring. Um, so over time, the, the breaches will become more and more successful as these nice channels will open up behind them. And so um, we're going to keep monitoring and we're going to keep doing projects. So uh, our next target is the north arm of the Fraser, where you can see there is also a very long jetty uh, pushing fish out to the ocean. So uh, the next steps are, are going to be to start going after uh, the north arm jetty. And yeah, thanks very much uh, for listening. And uh, I think we'll we'll do questions at the end. Hmm. Yeah, thanks awesome. so much for being. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Dave. It's really great to to visualize and see what's happening to these jetties and and the salmon that are basically utilizing these areas that are now opening up. Um, I, well, uh, yeah, we'll save questions for the end. I did have a quick question, but um, so all the sediment that is removed. Uh, are there plans to dis redistribute that or do you use that in different ways? Um, so for the most part, uh, unfortunately, we actually um, we had to dispose some of it um, on just either like on land or at sea. Uh, there's there's because it's out in the estuary, the sediment is kind of laden with salt. And that kind of limits the amount of, of uh, reuse that you can do. But it's certainly something that we're interested in doing in the future. Um, so we're, we're looking at uh, working with uh, some other groups on a big project to really reuse a lot of the sediment that gets uh, dredged from the river each year. And so that, that can make a big difference. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just the whole idea, I've, I've been, basically it's similar to this idea where you're in a swimming pool and if you're learning to swim and there's that gradual kind of slope, it's easier. But these jetties are almost uh, analogous to like pushing someone over the deep end. Yeah, <laughs> the totally. Ocean. But yeah, like I'm sure there's lots of questions. But so if you do have questions for Dave, just sit, save it, hold it, hold it in your head, and we'll come back to Dave at the end. But thanks for that, Dave. No problem. Yeah, thank Hi. you. And don't forget to uh, to give a like if you're on Facebook or an upvote if you're on YouTube, especially if you liked any of the things that our speakers have said today. Uh, I'm going to be sharing a little bit more about um, some sea life too. I'll be sharing, actually, I'll, uh, I'll pull up a slide. Hold on. I'll first talk a little bit about middens. Has anyone heard about a midden? Does anyone know what a midden is? It's, uh, it looks like a, a hill or something something there. Um, we'll go to our classrooms and ask if they know what a okay. midden is. Yeah. Let's see, uh, Tai, do you guys have a guess of what a midden is? Oh, go ahead. I think it's a mound of seashells, like deposited things. Okay. Nice, great guess. Let's ask Mr. Honer's class. What do you guys think? I was going to say it nice and loud, right into the mic here. A rock hill? Emily's thinking it's a rock hill. A rock hill, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Great observations. Okay. Um, a midden is, in fact, a, a mound of uh, shells. So a midden um, can be more than a shells, too. A midden is, is uh, it's kind of like a dump, but but a little bit different because, like, historically, people didn't have dumps like we do now. Um, but it's, it's a buildup of kind of domestic waste. So anything that like um, comes from food or household things um, that's, that's built up. So these middens are, are built up of shells um, of clams. And they build up because people have like left them there over the years and it's a, a kind of designated spot for them. Um, middens are also kind of, they come up a lot in terms of like history of where people have been. And indigenous people have kind of referenced middens a lot throughout the years to kind of show that people have been living there for thousands of years. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, clams today, uh, like these butter clams, also known as butters. A lot of my relatives like them. Uh, I'm not, it's my, not as, not my favorite seafood, but they're growing on me. Um, not literally, of course, but uh, yeah, butters are really great. Um, people have, have harvested them on the West Coast here in, in Wasinich and Coast Salish territories for a long time and, and still do. I think my aunt went out on Monday, I think, to get some. Um, these clams are really like a huge part of Wasinich kind of 
food culture. Uh, people have, I've been told people have like uh, dried them and even put them on strings to carry them. But now like one of my aunts, uh, she keeps them as a black bag, as a snack. Uh, she um, shared some with me in class like not too long ago. And, then, and they're pretty good dried, but again, they're not my favorite seafood. Uh, but they're huge, like a huge source of protein. And historically people have kind of traded them with people inland more, dried them, put them on a string, uh, carried them to the to the mainland and uh, traded them for things like blankets or um, anything else that they have there that, uh, yeah, that we can trade for from here. And that kind of system of, of, of trading uh, is also can be known as bartering. Uh, so bartering is like offering one good for another good. Um, and that's like a, a huge part of indigenous like economic systems is bartering. Um, yes, so these clams build up uh, into middens. Um, so that's what a midden is. Um, clams are, are huge in like uh, coastal history. This is a really uh, pretty famous now um, art piece by Bill Reed. Um, and yeah, clams and clam harvesting have been economically, culturally, and socially uh, important for indigenous people on the northwest coasts as well as around here too. Um, yes, this famous sculpture is called The Raven and the First Men by Bill Reed and represents the deep connection between clams and coastal people. There is uh, a bit of Hippocenich history about clams too uh, and how they came to be. Uh, a little bit about uh, how clams came to be in Hippocenich history is uh, through a creator, of course. For those of us that have been following the series, I've talked about a little bit about uh, the creator um, in Hussainic culture is um, like a supernatural being who created, um, you know, the, the life and animals, trees, the earth around us, and uh, always tells a kind of story in everything, how everything's created. And in the way that clams were created, it was a day when creator was transforming things, people into things. Um, so I, I think I've talked a little bit about how, how salmon came to be and things, but uh, one day creator was transforming people and some people were trying to run away and they, they would uh, dig themselves into the, into the sand on the beach and there's a story for each clam and how they kind of were transformed into, into how they were. But that's, that's uh, part of Wasanish history too. Um, the, Clams, though, how do people get them? How did my aunt go collect clams the other day? Um, that's the question. Do you hunt them, farm them, or collect clams? Um, one great way that people have collected clams over the years is through clam gardens. Um, clam gardens are just like, a, I guess, a regular beach, but it's been modified um, into like a, a very bountiful part of the beach where you can get clams. Clam gardens um, can, you know, produce 150 to 300% more clams than other beaches uh, because of the way like that they've set it up. So people have been setting this up, uh, like coastal indigenous people for thousands of years and they've been maintained over the years. Um, our food systems have been disrupted for about 80 years now or so. So a lot of these systems aren't um, in the same condition as they have been because of a lot of circumstances and, um, you know, things that have happened in the last few years. Um, but these clam gardens are very bountiful in the way that they're, they're designed. Uh, they, they're like kind of designed in what's like called the intertidal zone. And the intertidal zone is the part between the ocean and like the, the drier part of the beach. Uh, so you can see here, let me get this laser up. There's a low tide zone, like right by the ocean. Um, and then there's the mid tide, high tide and splash zone. So around here, um, it's where the tide comes up and down. It's right in between the two points where, at that, where it's at its highest and lowest. So it's usually very rocky. Um, it can be sandy, of course, too. Uh, but a lot of things like to attach themselves to the rocks like, let's see, barnacles, mussels, um, so many of these like, like to be attached to the ground because, you know, the waves disrupt them a lot too. Um, and clam gardens are really great in intertidal zones. They only are really around there. Um, you can see here, clam gardens, um, 
do best in a situation kind of like this. So there's like a um, like a bit of a, a rock wall here to keep kind of um, like the the water a little bit in the intertidal zone. Um, and yes, let me go back. So yeah, clam gardens are right between the ocean and the sea here. And if they're kind of designed and engineered in the right way, um, you can get a lot of, of clam growth. Um, so these, of course, were in someone's territory and each kind of family would be tending to um, a clam garden. And yeah, all of this, like a lot of this information I got from clamgarden.com. Uh, so that's the, the clam garden network. They do a lot of restoration in clam gardens. They're actually having a webinar coming up soon, uh, digging into clam gardens conversations, um, where priority will be like given in attendance to uh, those working in local nations. Um, so this is gonna lead to a lot of restoration work in clam gardens and like leading to indigenous people tending to these, these huge like food sources that are like very healthy, uh, huge in protein, and is a great way to kind of rebuild indigenous food sovereignty. Uh, but I think that's all I'll say about clams for now. Awesome. Yeah, so Peter, do you know of a lot of uh, like clam garden restoration projects that are happening locally close to you? Uh, yes, um, there are some. I know there's a, a plan in Sainich to do some uh, clam restoration. There's uh, plans for kind of different types of clams. Um, and there's a, a lot throughout the island and islands. Uh, I think there's quite a bit on Pender Islands. And a lot of it's um, done through, these, through this uh, uh, clam garden network. Uh, one of the huge kind of advocates uh, for restoration of clam gardens is Sky Augustine. Um, and there's a lot more on, on their page on kind of specific sites for clam garden restoration and what's in store and uh, also tips on how to kind of rebuild a, a clam garden. Amazing. Have you ever seen one live? I've seen some uh, remains of them, not, not a kind of up-to-date one though, but I've seen some definitely some really good beaches with lots of clams and uh, yeah, I've like been harvesting a bit, and um, yeah, I've seen my relatives do a lot of harvesting. Mm. Yeah, I don't know about you, Peter. I love clams; they're delicious. But oh, yeah, it's such a great concept of of really maximizing that inner tile area to mm -hmm. to have the space to maximize the clams. So yeah, mm -hmm. so we'll come back for for questions at the end. Um, and so now I'm gonna shift over to our next presenter. Uh, so this is another Rainco scientist, and she is representing one of our newest initiatives that Rainco is undertaking. Um, and so I'll let her kind of share more on, on her project, but it, I'm gonna introduce Shauna Dahl. She's our Gulf Islands Forest Project Coordinator. Um, yeah, lots of work going on in the Gulf Islands. So I'll, I'll, let, I'll introduce Shauna and let you take it away. Oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> there we go. Classic mistake. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen here. All right. Beautiful. Hmm. Okay. Here we are. It's on. All right, so like Maureen said, my name is Shauna and I work as the Gulf Islands Forest Project Coordinator. So I'm just gonna walk you through uh, some of the work that we do in the Gulf Islands. So essentially the Gulf Islands Forest Project uh, aims to protect forests on the Gulf Islands. It's exactly what it sounds like. It was launched in response to some growing concerns about dwindling forests across the Gulf Islands, despite the fact that the local government there was created to avoid the losses of forests. 
Um, so most of my work is focused on Sadeus, perhaps more commonly known as the Pender Islands, uh, which like the majority of Gulf Islands are covered with coastal Douglas fir forests. So I'm going to call the coastal Douglas fir forest CDF just for uh, shortness's sake. Um, and this is the smallest of the 16 kind of forest zones in this province. And I have a map here for you to kind of give you an idea of exactly how small it is. So this is all of BC. You see all 16 zones and very down at the very bottom of Vancouver Island and a little bit of the mainland, you see that yellow and that is the CDF. Um, so it only covers 0.3% of the province. But even though it's so small, it has so much value. It is the traditional territory of so many Coast Salish nations. And it's one of the most biodiverse regions in the province with some of the greatest capacity to store carbon. Um, but it also is one of the places that people really love to live. So because people keep moving here, there's a lot of development. And it's meant that about 50% of this forested region has been changed uh, due to human activities. So that means that there's less than 1% of the forests in this region are still considered old growth. And as of this year, almost uh, every plant community in this region is considered threatened or endangered by the province. So it's not doing very well. And here you can see a closer uh, shot of exactly what this extent is. Uh, it's called the Coastal Douglas Fir Maritime uh, variant. The MM is representative of that. So you see we've got all the Gulf Islands in here and just the southern tip of Vancouver Island and some of the mainland. So the work that we do is multifaceted. We have to do a lot of different work to try to protect these islands. One of the really big barriers is that a lot of the land here is privately owned. Um, so we need to come up with new policy to try to protect these privately owned lands. Uh, one of the things that we've done is we worked with a small organization within the University of Victoria called the Environmental Law Center, and they put up together a report for us that summarized all of the policy tools that might be available to the Islands Trust, which is the local government, to make changes to better protect these forests. Uh, so I often go to council meetings and write letters to ministers and do presentations like this one or write op-eds in local newspapers to let people know that they need to put pressure on the government to better protect these ecosystems. And here in this picture, you see a clear cut that happened on Pender Island just recently. This is 10 acres that has been cleared to build one house. So that's a lot of destruction for one person to build a house. Something else that we do is education and outreach. Uh, so one of the big things that we do with education is the Pender Islands Big Tree Registry. This is a program that allows people to go out and measure the big trees in their community and let people know that these big trees are out there and that they deserve protection. It's a great way for people to learn more about their local ecosystems, uh, get out there and contribute to conservation work and get to know their backyards just a little bit better. Um, we collaborate a lot with other organizations that do similar work like this. So up north in the Discovery Islands, like Cortez, uh, we've worked a little bit with them trying to get a big tree registry off the ground there. And there's also a BC wide big tree registry and anyone can nominate a tree. So if you know any big trees in your neighborhood, I highly recommend. Uh, encourage you to go out and measure those big trees and get them in there. We also do um, with other work with other organizations and we're still building our capacity to try to uh, extend our reach and get people uh, aware of what's happening on these islands. And that's a great way to make policy a little bit more effective is to let the communities know what's happening so that they can be part of that change. Something else we do is uh, research and collaboration. We've been working with uh, labs at UBC and at Washington State University to monitor some of the trees and uh, other habitats in this region. One project we've been working on is um, monitoring western red cedar. Something that's happening as a result of climate change is that western red cedar is see, uh, being uh, heavily impacted and we're seeing it dying back all up and down the Pacific Northwest. So there's a lot of different folks who are collecting data on this to try to come up with strategies for better protecting these culturally significant and ecologically significant trees. 
And one of the most recent undertakings that we have started up is uh, land protection. So this is 13 acres on North Pender Island. Uh, we recently purchased this piece of land with the Pender Islands Conservancy. So this uh, piece of property, as you can see, has this really beautiful wetland. There's some maturing forests. Unfortunately, on the Pender Islands, there's not a lot of old growth left. But what we hope is that by protecting pieces like this, that we might be able to see it become the old growth of the future. Um, so not only is this a beautiful habitat, but it's, it has it supports really great uh, species that are very characteristic of this region. And I wanted to get some of the students here involved in this presentation. And I wonder if anyone can tell me what this species is. Is anyone familiar with this species? I see some hands up at Taiyi Elementary. Who knows? Bullfrog? Good guess, but not quite. Yeah, yeah, it's a tree frog. It's, it, it's known locally as the Pacific tree frog. And this is of particular significance at this time of year because it is the frog moon in the Wasanich 13 moon calendar. And I was actually on the property just last week and we heard a ton of Pacific forest frogs, which, uh, chorus frogs, sorry, which made me very excited. Um, this is another species that can often be found here. This is a provincially threatened species. And I wonder if anyone knows what kind of bird this must might be. Birds are hard. I'm just learning bird identification myself. David, go ahead. Is it a finch? Is it a finch? It's not a finch. As a hint, one of the calls it makes is it says, quick, three beers. Quick, three beers. I, I think it looks a bit, I'm going to take a guess with Mockingbird. I don't think it is, though. Good try. It's actually an olive-sided flycatcher. <laughs> So it was a really good try. This little cap, it has like a little pointed cap on its head. That's a really great way to identify it. And actually we've named this property Sedaeus Flycatcher Forest after this bird in recognition of the fact that bird, this bird is being kind of pushed out of its regular range because of habitat loss. So it's a good reminder of why we do this work is to protect the habitats of these species. Uh, I wonder if anyone can name this species that's very characteristic of this region. It's a tree species that everyone here I imagine is familiar with. Does anyone know? Our beauties, nice. Oh, sorry, you came all the way up. <laughs> Great job, everybody. It's our beauties. And this one is another one that's really being impacted by climate change. We're seeing it suffer a little bit from these drier summers we've been having. So we're trying to do some work monitoring these as well. And I have one more, and this is a pretty easy one. I hope you can all get it. This is one that we often see. Yeah, you can all say it. I'll say it. Beaver. Yes, nice. I actually, I almost put my foot in the beaver dam last week, so I have to be a little bit more careful when I'm walking around the wetland. But yes, the beaver is also found there. So that's just a little bit about the work that we're doing on the Gulf Islands, and I look forward to some questions at the end of the this uh, webinar. Thanks, Shauna. That was really great. So this this new kind of land acquisition, it's such a, a beautiful place and um, so happy it's going to be protected. Will you turn that into a place where education, where people can eventually come and, and learn more? Heck yes. Yeah, we'll keep you all posted on opportunities to come and learn. I'm so excited to see it. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, we'll save questions for, for Shauna and everyone at the end. Um, but thanks for that, Chana. I'm just gonna put you back Thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go straight into presenting our next uh, and final speaker from Rain Coast. Um, and in our first season of Coastal Insights, we did uh, kind of an extensive episode on Southern resident killer whales. So if you haven't watched that, I highly recommend it just to get a good background. Uh, on these amazing creatures that have such rich culture, language, um, family dynamics. Uh, and so Raincoast does a lot of work 
with protection of southern resident killer whales located in San Jose. And so here to share more on that topic is our Rain Coast Wildlife or Wild Salmon Program Biologist and Director, but she's so much more than that, uh, Misty McDuffie. Greetings. Greetings, Mo, and classrooms and all. Here, I'm going to just start sharing my screen. OK, uh, hopefully you've got that. So um, the whales that we're going to talk about today are, are um, resident salmon-eating killer whales. And I just want to ask the classrooms, this is just one of the type of killer whales that we have in British Columbia, the salmon eating whales. Does anybody know what, um, what some of the other types, other two types of killer whales that we have in our waters are? Um, is it the seal? Well, one of them eats seals. So they're the seal eating whales. And they're called um, Biggs killer whales, or um, they used to be called transient killer whales. And then there's one other kind of killer whales that we have in British Columbia. Any guesses on what they might eat? Whales. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a good guess because sometimes the um, the Biggs killer whales will eat, they will eat other whales. Um, but the third type that we have, they eat other kinds of fish and sharks. So those are the three types. So we, we've got the resident salmon eating killer whales, the mammal eating killer whales, and then the fish eating killer whales. But the ones that um, we're talking about today are the southern resident killer whales. And what this figure is showing is all the different populations of salmon eating killer whales um, in the Northeast Pacific Ocean. And the range of those of all these salmon eating killer whales overlaps with the range of their favorite food, which is Chinook salmon. So this is just showing um, how that th it's, it's salmon and specifically Chinook salmon that are really um, driving the presence of these whales in, um, in the Northeast Pacific Ocean. So um, also what you can see here is that the southern residents down here in the bottom, because they're the most southerly, um, are the smallest of these four populations. And they're also endangered. And the reason is because that over the last 20 years, there's been more deaths than births in this population. And that's led to their decline and their um, recognition as endangered and the declining status and their um, models done to look at their status suggest that if things don't change for these whales, that there's a 25% chance that they'll be extinct within, um, within this century. So we've got a lot of work to do if we're going to recover these whales. And just to sort of capture what the threats are to these whales, they're grouped into three sort of simple categories to um, to sort of narrow the focus on what needs to be done. And the first one is that they're limited by the amount of food that is available to eat. And that is the Chinook salmon that they prefer to eat. And secondly, the noise and the disturbance from so much boat traffic in the waters where they're feeding and traveling and communicating and breathing and giving their calves are getting very noisy and congested. And the noise can mask their calls and their echolocation feeding calls that can interfere with them. And the presence of vessels, especially the close proximity of vessels, can disrupt their feeding patterns. So it means that they're, again, it's another way of them not getting enough food. And then the third common um, grouping for the threats to these whales is the um, pollutants that are in the waters and in their food. And when these pollutants get into their body, it reduces the number of successful pregnancies that they can have, and it can influ influence the development of, of young whales, calves, fetuses, and, um, and into young adults. So if we were to flip that around and say, okay, well, those are the threats, then what would we 
um, if we if we could, you know, write the magic list of what we could do to recover these whales, what would be on that list? And so first, there'd be an adequate abundance of their preferred prey, these Chinook salmon. So there's there would be enough of them to eat. And then those fish would have to be available year round, like every month and week, they'd have to be able to have enough to eat. And they, they prefer the largest and the oldest of these Chinook salmon. So there's sometimes there's lots of Chinook salmon in the ocean, but they're not all big old fish. They can be young fish and immature fish and fish that just don't get as big as the ones that the killer whales like to eat. And then the, the waters that they live in would have to be quiet enough so that it supports their successful feeding and their communication with other whales. And finally, those waters that they're swimming in and feeding in would be unpolluted. So in the last um, few years, Raincoast and our partners have been working to try to get these measures in place. And I'm going to go through some of these measures and they might be a little bit complex, but when it gets down to how we implement solutions to solving these problems, um, there's there's a lot of things that need to be done, but this is is an important one. And the and the first one, or, or actually combining some of those threats, is um, the waters that they that the southern residents are swimming in when they're in Canada. And the green on this figure is the what we call the critical habitat, the most important habitat for these whales on the Canadian side. They also are on the U.S. side. That's in the in the brown area. But the green is their critical habitat. And the areas in blue, this one, this one, and this one, are areas that killer whale scientists have identified as being really important for feeding. And when killer whales are following Chinook, they are following Chinook returning to the Fraser River. And so those fish, can you guys see my cursor when I move it around? Or is it just me that's moving my cursor? <laughs> Does it show up? Oh, well. Okay, so the, um, when Chinook are migrating, they're coming down the west side of Vancouver Island, and they are moving um, into the Salish Sea and into Harrow Strait and through the Gulf Islands and um, on their way to the, to the Fraser River, to return to the Fraser River. And, um, and this, these are the important areas through the Juan de Fuca, through the Gulf Islands and the approaches to the Fraser that killer whale scientists have identified as being important and needing protection. But when we look at what's been done in terms of protecting those areas, it sort of falls short. So we look at the areas in yellow in, within those important areas, and this is the area through the Juan de Fuca, so it's about half of what the scientists originally identified. They did protect the area through the Gulf Islands, along with making other areas that would be free from um, vessels and fishing, but nothing in the in the um, mouth of the Fraser. So these are areas that have been set aside from um, the competition from fishing boats and the noise and the disturbance from fishing boats. And in the case of the Gulf Islands and out here on Swiftshire Bank, set aside from any vessels traveling through them at all. And, and the idea of this is to give the whales some space where they can, um, where they can feed and and hear their echolocation calls and not be disturbed by the presence of um, of fishing boats. And then um, the other area that we're making some progress in is um, reducing the disturbance from vessels and. Um, that comes from the disturbance that's created by the presence of ships and the uh, propeller sound and the engine sounds that again can mask their feeding calls. So, um, so what um, Raincoast and its partners have been able to um, to, to uh, accomplish in partnership with the federal government or urging the federal government to implement measures. So now there's much greater buffer zones between the distance that um, boats can get close to whales so that now boats have to stay 400 meters away from Southern resident killer whales. And, um, it, and because Southern resident killer whales tend to be followed by um, boats a lot of the times that they come into the Salish Sea, um, whale watching on these whales has been uh, stopped by the government, again, just to give the whales more 
um, space from and um, for freedom from the noise and the disturbance of the vessels. And then also in some of the parts of those important habitats, sanctuaries have been created where no vessels can go at all. So those are some areas we've making some progress, but there's been some other areas where we um, haven't been making uh, progress. And that is our call to um, for no more expansion of big shipping projects through the Salish Sea. And, and two examples of those big shipping projects are the Trans Mountain expansion that's happening um, in Burnaby and is associated with a lot more large ships and tankers that will be traveling through these waters. And also the expansion out near the ferry terminal at Terminal 2 that would greatly increase the number of ships that are moving through the Salish Sea. And many scientists believe now that the Salish Sea is already too congested and too noisy for Southern resident killer whales and it's got to get quieter. And if we keep expanding these shipping projects, it's only going to get noisier and more congested. Another place where we really haven't made any progress is in um, protecting salmon habitat. And there are lots of ways that we live in these watersheds and, and the watersheds that we live in, and we're impacting how salmon are able to um, feed and grow and um, spawn and successfully have their eggs hatched and you know swim to the ocean and return again. And that's everything from logging through to um, the, our, the use of agricultural lands and the lack of riparian protection to simply more houses and pavement and buildings that are in the watersheds that flow to salmon rivers. And then finally, when it comes to um, climate change and the impacts that climate change has on salmon habitat, we're making very little progress there as well. And then one other area, an important area where we're trying to get more traction is on the impacts that marine Chinook fishing has on, on, um, on killer whales. And this isn't to end all um, fishing. It's just that the places that Chinook fishing happens are not good places for either the fish or for the whales. And we're trying to change where these fisheries occur and let more fish get back to their rivers of origin. And then again, the third big area that we're again not we're we're trying to understand a lot more about pollutants and um, what kind of pollutants are in our waters. But in terms of actually reducing the number of pollutants that are going into waters that killer whales and Chinook rely on, um, we're not we haven't made much progress yet. It's a big problem, and these pollutants aren't just coming from our local waters; they're coming from global. Um, from the global airshed as well. So um, how we uncontaminate our waters is a, is a big challenge that still lies ahead. So I think I'm just going to wrap it up there. And I just want to say that um, when we look at 2020, there was actually, it was a year where we had more births than deaths of killer whales. And that is a really encouraging sign that maybe that we're doing the right things that we've started along this track. We've got a lot more to do and a long way to go, but, um, but we had successful births over the last um, year or so. And, um, and this is a really good sign for whales. Awesome. Thank you, Misty. It's, uh, it's very promising to hear that been some new births in the population hopefully it's a it's a new it's a new chapter <laughs> coming forward but yeah if yeah again if, if you haven't had a chance to check out our coastal insights on killer whales um it goes really in depth into really understanding the different ecotypes and their language and family dynamics and it's it's quite spectacular um to learn about these amazing creatures all right. Well, that was quite a fully loaded episode, and we are so fortunate to have all of these amazing people um, to have a snapshot of what's going on in our communities um, addressing these conservation issues. So we're going to go straight to questions now. So if anybody has any questions, um, we will take them right now. And yeah, we're, we're a little bit over time, but if you have time to stay for questions, um, we'll just address some of those now. I know there was one from Andrew. So this one, I think 
I'm going to bring everybody back. Uh, Shauna, Dave. Okay. Yeah. So this question is, I believe, for Shauna. Shauna, one of the students from Pender Island would like to get involved and help him out. How can he? Yeah. Um, you can email me at shauna at raincoast.org. I have a couple of volunteers that are helping with the big tree registry, and I'm always looking for more help to register those big trees. So send me an email and we'll set it up. I can take you out measuring. Awesome. And I'm just going to open that up to everybody's project. So Misty and Dave, um, if people want to actively get involved, and do something tangible, what would you suggest people do? Uh, let's start with Dave. Mm. Uh, ours is a little tougher because uh, it's hard to get out there. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, there's not a lot that we can, uh, that we can really have, you know, like volunteers or, or anything doing on this project, uh, just because of the logistics of kind of getting out to the sites and everything. So, um, yeah, just, uh, you know, supporting, um, you know, our politicians and folks that are investing in these types of projects uh, to, to make sure that, you know, they keep investing in them. So uh, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty much all I got. <laughs> okay. um, I mean, yeah, if you want to learn more, too, there's, um, there's our Connected Estuary webinar that we have every other week as well. And that focus entirely on understanding the estuary and what's happening. Um, so you can feel free to follow that at that link right there. Um, but yeah, let's go to Misty. What do you think people can do to help the Southern resident killer whales? I think that if the classrooms or anybody wanted to write the premier of British Columbia and mm -hmm. tell him how important salmon habitat is, not just for the recovery of salmon, but for the recovery of killer whales, and that we have got to start protecting the watersheds that are the home of these of, of wild salmon. And that is the one thing that we're really lagging behind on. And it's possibly one of the most important things that we can do for, for recovery of both salmon and for killer whales. And for forests. They're important and for, for forests. forests too. Yes. <laughs> Everything is connected. So, Everything yeah. is connected. You get the full bang if you're going to go for protecting the habitat that that these species rely on. All right. I think we have a, a question from Tidy Elementary. So I'm bringing you guys up on. Tidy, do you guys have a, a question? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Jordan. Sorry, we're going to have this thing come up as possible. Okay. okay. So, um, so my question was, um, how long did it take to collect data in the breaches in 2020? Yeah, good question. So it, it took us uh, yeah, quite a bit of time. Uh, we start doing our sampling in March and then we go out about every two weeks. So uh, every two weeks we're back at the site sampling again uh, and all the way through into August. So uh, I've got a crew of, uh, of, of people that, that come out and, and help us out. And I think in total, we probably did about um, probably about 24 days of, of sampling actually at the breaches, but spread out uh, yeah, across that, that whole uh, summer from March all the way through into August. Awesome. Um, there's another question about the estuary here. So Nicole Williamson uh, she said she spoke to the First Nation community at Luet a few years back, and they said salmon numbers were dropping. Have they noticed any difference upstream based on the work done in the estuary? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. Um, so for our project, uh, we actually just created the breaches in, in the spring of 2019. Um, so with those fish going out in, in 2019, um, you could potentially see some of those adults starting to come back uh, in, in the fall of 2021. Um, so I think, you know, it's gonna be hard to actually see, uh, see a difference related just to the breaches, uh, kind of if you look just at the spawning grounds, cause there's a lot of things affecting how many fish are making it back, but um, yeah, hopefully in the in the years to come, uh, we we might start to see a difference. Okay. 
Okay, I'm gonna go to Kai for one last question. Uh, okay, um, are there also threats endangering the salmon on the Atlantic coast? And if so, are there actions being taken to help? Yeah, great question. Do you wanna take that, Misty? Sure. Um, yes, the, uh, um, the, the salmon on the Atlantic coast, wild salmon on the Atlantic salmon are, are really, really endangered. In fact, they're, they're so endangered that they don't have fisheries on those salmon anymore. And when they come back into the rivers on the East coast, it's really a big deal. And what it, what it is is a lesson on how not to manage our salmon populations of Pacific salmon on the West coast and whether through overfishing or habitat loss, um, which is what drove most of those Atlantic salmon populations to um, extinction in many in many places. Uh, that that yeah, we don't we don't want to go down that same road here on the Pacific. And unfortunately, we're not making a lot of change to deviate from that path. So they do have them on the Atlantic coast, but they're the the wild rivers with Atlantic salmon in them are are really rare. Okay. Yeah, great question. Um, I'm going to do, sorry, I said that was the last question, but this is the very last question. Um, so, Rye Brett Tompkins asked, why do you take the fish out of the water? Oh, Dave, I think you're on mute. So for our sampling work, uh, we just want to see how big the fish are and what species they are. So um, when when you can see those fish and those viewers, they're still in they're in water in, in the viewer there. Um, and so we just we quickly uh, just look at the fish, see what species it is. Uh, we see how, how big it is. Uh, and then from a few of those fish, we take uh, just a little clip of one of their fins uh, for a genetic analysis. Uh, and then we uh, put them back in the water and, and let them go on their way. And just for clarification, it does not harm the fish, correct? No, we just take a really small clip um, from, from their fin and, and they're growing so fast at that point that they, they grow back pretty quick. So on that, have you noticed any like size shifts or changes over the years in salmon sizes? Yeah, so we see a little bit of a, a difference in the size of the fish coming out, um, which seems to be based on kind of the, the winter. So in the coldest year, the coldest winter that we've had over the six year, five years, the smallest fish came out that spring. Uh, and in a more mild winter, we seem to see fish coming out uh, a little bit bigger. Uh, so they're just developing a little quicker uh, and just growing a little quicker um, when it's when it's warmer. So um, yeah, it's a, a little bit of a difference, not a, not a huge difference, but, uh, but definitely significant. Amazing. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you everybody today for, for sharing all these amazing projects and, and work that everyone's doing on the coast. So much dedication and passion. Um, and hopefully, yeah, more people get involved. But I just want to bring our classroom. Well, the classroom has to be. Okay, you want to say a quick goodbye? Friday. Awesome. And thank you again to all the presenters um, for joining. And hopefully, yeah, everyone can follow you. Uh, if you want more information, just visit our uh, Rain Coast website and you'll basically find all the information on the work that everyone's doing. Um, yeah, thank you. And then so we're going to do a quick uh, intro to our next episode. So we have one last episode. Um, in two weeks, and it's a spotlight on Guardians of the Coast, the next generation of stewards. So there's so many young, inspiring people that are coming up and really um, taking a stand and being leaders in their communities. And so we're going to feature two amazing young leaders, Mercedes Robinson and Robin Buss, um, who, are, who are great stewards of their communities, and they're going to share their stories. So join us for that last episode. Um, yeah. I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. I'd also like to, to give a quick shout out to the sponsors for making this episode possible. Uh, thank you to, to everyone for yeah helping us, supporting us, and uh, getting us online. Thanks. And yeah, panelists, is there any last words you guys want to say? Well, thank you for tuning in, yeah, everybody. Thanks. 
All right. Being dedicated to coastal conservation. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Hope everyone keeps up the good work. And see you next time. Bye. See you. Bye.